Okay, so uh, what I want to do today is to introduce a few ideas that uh, I've been working through. I mean, this is really the start of a research project that uh, should span over, uh, hopefully, the next couple of years. Uh, again, I mean, beginning of my career, right? Um, so thinking about cognitive environment. Uh, here, I mean I, I mean, I have in this talk a dual project. The first part is pedagogical. I mean, the, the pedagogical part has been published in a couple of papers, uh, one that will appear very soon in Topoi. Uh, I mean, this is work I conduct with uh, Tim Kenyon, who happens to be a colleague of uh, Paul at University of Waterloo. Uh, and I mean, a lot of it is uh, involved, I mean, it has to do with how we teach and how we think about teaching critical thinking. Uh, right? So the idea in this part of the talk is that despite all our research and reasoning, and despite all of what we hear uh, in, I mean, in, 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 in what we've heard in the last few days, uh, it seems that we still have difficulties in actually helping people reason better, right? So I mean, we try to understand reasoning. We do lots of work to understand what reasoning is and what it's about and what are the processes involved. Uh, but in the end, it seems that uh, when it comes to actually helping people to reason better, we have a lot of trouble doing it. Uh, I mean, after a logic course, uh, people still fail doing the waste and selection task, right? Uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I mean, it's still interesting to see that people have a lot of trouble applying these, uh, these lessons, right? Uh, and in that part of the project, I want to suggest a framework that will broaden what counts as better reasoning, or more specifically, as critical thinking overall, right? So here, I mean, I, I mean I'll, I'll be a little bit loose uh, with terms, uh, something you can blame me for since I'm a philosopher. Uh, but I mean, hopefully, I mean, it will be clear enough given what we've been talking about in the last few days. Um, and so this framework, though, I think has really interesting theoretical co consequences. So uh, for the study of reasoning, I think that some things should change, or we should emphasize or think about in uh, and reflect on certain types of processes that we don't necessarily look into when we look at the mainstream literature on reasoning. I don't want to suggest that no one does it. I mean, I think there's some interesting work and some uh, up and coming I mean, work that has been done in the past few years. Uh, but I want to say that maybe this is something we should emphasize a little bit more. So my take home message uh, on two slides, and then I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, the first idea is that the most common takes on reasoning and on teaching critical thinking are too limited, right? And here, I mean, not that I want to, uh, to oppose what, uh, what Paul was saying about teaching critical thinking. I think that teaching, uh, I mean, things about biases and how we can correct biases and so on is really, really important. But I think that even that is a too limited view of what reasoning and what critical thinking is. Right? I don't want to say this is a wrong view. Right? I'm not saying this is wrong. I mean, this is something I really want to emphasize because in every single review of the papers I've written on this, people have said, well, you shouldn't reject that individual learning about biases and so on. I mean, I'm, saying, I, I'm not rejecting it. I'm just saying that this is too limited a view. We should enlarge it. We should broaden what we think about when we talk about this. Right? So this is interesting. This should be pursued, but it's too limited. Right? So there is an interest in broadening the scope of what we should study when we are interested in these topics, right? So uh, Tim Canyon and I call this uh, the scope of the biasing. Uh, so broadening uh, the scope of critical thinking has two main sets of consequences we want to say. We should revise how we teach reasoning, and we should broaden what we stu study when we look at how people reason. And I think this can also apply to the study of animal cognition. I'll have a few slides on this. In, uh, some recent work I've been pursuing with a former student of UCAM, uh, Frédéric Ismail Banville, uh, who is currently finishing his PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Um, so what's the problem I'm interested in, uh, interested in here? Uh, it's difficult to teach critical thinking. That's the main thing, right? It's really, really difficult to do it. Uh, I mean, I'm teaching critical thinking to about a thousand students a year. Uh, and hopefully it takes, I mean, they get something out of my course, but I mean, I think that in the end, if we were to have them do most of the tasks that we have been looking at in the last few days, I mean, most of them would still have, uh, I, mean, I mean, just average results in those, uh, in those tasks. And I mean, that's a bit depressing to think about, right? I mean, we want people to think better, we want people to be better at reasoning, but still, I mean, the way we seem to be doing it is not working, right? And this is especially true when we teach individual, individual strategies. And I mean, that's a really important point I want to make uh, today. Um, the idea here uh, is that the way we are doing critical thinking, especially even when we teach about, say, different cognitive biases that exist and different strategies to overcome them, sometimes it actually backfires. 
So sometimes when you teach people about, say, racial bias, by thinking about racial bias, say, uh, people will say, I shouldn't associate black people with guns. And so they repeat that in their head, right? Black people should not be associated with guns. But one of the things we know about cognition is, is that it's really, really bad at processing negation. So what it actually does is that it strengthens the connection between black people and guns. Uh, another thing that can happen that we see quite often is that people uh, tend to uh, be certain. So um, now I know about uh, cognitive biases. I know about how this works. Uh, so I'm really, really good at fighting my cognitive biases. So they are so certain to, to have overcome all of their biases that they even act with even more certainty, which, in fact, makes it the case that whatever biases is left is even stronger. Right? So these are some of the bad consequences that can happen when we teach critical thinking in some of the ways that have been done. Right? So the, I mean, the question I'm asking here is that how can we make sure that we give students the best tools uh, so that they can make the best possible decision with the information they have, right? How they can, can they reason through a situation in the best possible way? So the traditional approach, uh, so the so sort of mainstream approach that we see right now in the critical thinking literature is uh, some, I mean, something close to, to what Paul was suggesting earlier. And I, again, I mean, it's just, I mean you, you mentioned it during your talk, so you're an easy target here. Uh, but I, mean, I, I think this is a really interesting thing to do, and I think that was an interesting development. And still in the critical thinking literature, the, sort of the, the textbooks that we have access to, very few of those actually mention uh, cognitive biases at all. Uh, Tim Canyon's book, Clear Thinking in the Blurry Wall, is one of the few exceptions. Uh, and I mean, that's the one I use in my own, uh, in my own course. Right? So in that tradition, a lot of people say that critical thinking is something along these lines. right? Self-guided, self-disciplined thinking. Or an even longer quote by Paul and Elder that, uh, that in the end, critical thinking is self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective thinking, right? So there's really this, this insistence here on the role of the individual and how individually we have to work through these problems and how we, think, and we have to think about them. Um, so basically what we want to do is to make individuals better thinkers and we want them to be better thinkers alone. So Tim and I uh, call this the intuitive approach to the bias, which is Teaching facts about biases, including a taxonomy of biases and their various propensities to distort reasoning, uh, is a reasonably effective means of providing students in critical reasoning courses with skills enabling the detection and mitigation of biases, including students' own biases. Right? So that's I mean, what we, we, we claim is some sort of the mainstream approach right now in the critical thinking literature. <coughs> what we want to say right, is that the biasing uh, as an individual and in the situation where the biasing is most required is often extraordinarily difficult. People are bad at it, but they're not bad at it because they're bad. They're bad at it because it's really, really, really tough. That's probably the, 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 the toughest way in which people can uh, get to uh, fight their own cognitive biases. Right? And our, our, our claim is that critical thinking in social settings seems to fare slightly better and that this should be included in how we think about teaching critical thinking. To teach people how to uh, put themselves in the right thinking environment, in the right cognitive environment, and that's what I want to defend today. Right? And why is that the case? Well, wh when we look, so I mean, this is a figure from Stanovich and West. Uh, Wilson and Brack in a 1994 paper have a similar account. But the idea is that in order to successfully debias, you have not only to have the right, what they call a mindware, so sorry, the, the cognitive tool, the, the, I mean, the, the, say the logical rule or something along these lines. You have to have it, right? But you also need to detect the need to use it. So, I mean, if I have a waste and selection task, I have to know that I have to use motor stolens in order to solve it properly. So I have to know motor stolens, but I have to know that I have to use it, right? And not only that, but I have to have enough mental power, enough energy, and so on, to want to actually do it, right? I have to have, I mean, say, I mean, the, the cognitive availability to want to use it in the proper situation. And, uh, right, so, so, so do I have the decoupling capacity to, to do that? And unless I say yes to all of these questions, then uh, what they say is that usually I have the heuristic response, right, which is the biased response in a way, right? So, what happens here is that people very rarely actually detect that they need to use these tools. They know the tools, they learn them in their courses, their critical thinking course or their logical course, uh, but when it comes to actually using them, they just don't detect that uh, they need to do it at the time. Right? What we claim, though, is a promising direction, and that's something we have seen uh, coming up in the literature, 
is that there are other strategies that involve removing the cause of the bias that are also employed with much success. So a lot of you might know about the marshmallow task, so the Walter Michel classical experiment, right? So I mean, th this is the experiment uh, which is basically tortured for children. Uh, you put the children alone in a room that has nothing in it uh, but a table and a chair, and then you give the, the kid a marshmallow. You, you tell the kid, I'll leave the room, leave you with the marshmallow. If, the, if you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you a second one when I come back. So, so I mean, you, you might want to go on YouTube and look at like kids' video on this, and it's really, really super cute. But one of the, the things that some of these really smart kids are doing is that they turn around or they cover their eyes, right? They're manipulating their environment so that the temptation is less evident, it's, it's less present, right? And, and that's something a lot of kids are actually doing. One of the, the, the things and one of the problems I see here in the way we look at that task is that we think that the kids uh, who uh, I mean, succeed in the task, who don't eat the marshmallow, are uh, supposed to be doing better in life and so on. But we don't make a distinction in the way we code the, I mean, the results and so on in most of these experiments. We don't code the difference between the kid who stays and looks at the marshmallow the whole way through, which requires a lot of self-control, versus the kid who turns around or uses other types of strategy to help, uh, I mean, to, to, to help himself or herself uh, not to eat the marshmallow. And what I want to see in this talk is that this is actually a really interesting difference and one that should be studied more thoroughly, right? So this idea of the scope of the biasing we have is the following. We want to broaden and make more precise the taxonomy of the biasing strategy by bringing social, uh, social environmental infrastructure uh, to play in a range of ways, right? So we want in that way to expand a range of things to teach that could help people mitigate biases subsequently. So we propose a four-level taxonomy, and I'll walk you through the taxonomy and then try to apply it in various ways. So the first way, so what we call level one, the biasing, is the type of the biasing where we make sure that the bias doesn't arise at all, right? So mitigating an agent's general disposition to produce a particular sort of bias judgment in the first place. So I mentioned before something like racial bias. So how do we make sure that racial bias doesn't come up in the first place? One of the things we can do is we modify society. So what I mean by this is that we make, it sure, we make sure that people see each other, that they live in very diverse areas of town, that they take public transportation, that they see the, the, the diverse people every day, and so on and so forth. And as time goes on, and there are studies on this, that people who live in more diverse environments, who see more different people every day when they go to work, and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, these people tend to be less biased. Right? So this seems to work. So here we would try to eliminate completely the source of bias. The thing is, that, so, I mean, so, so we can develop some expertise over time. It's very, very efficient when it succeeds. But the problem we have is that it cannot be taught in 45 hours. And so there's no way I can use that in my critical thinking course. Right? Uh, but ideally, I would want that I mean, when a cognitive bias exists, that I can identify it, I might want to completely eliminate it. In some cases, it might not be possible. In some cases, we know it's, it might be possible. But it just requires too much time and energy and so on and so forth. The second level is that uh, of the uh, intuitive approach. So the idea is that we train agents to de deploy cognitive strategies that mitigate biased judgments when they arise in context. Right? So when I'm given uh, a logical task, I'm supposed to know that I should use the logical tools. So I employ them, I think about them, I detect that they need to be used, and so on and so forth. So the sort of Stanovich uh, diagram we have seen before. And then I try to have students uh, succeed in that in the proper context. So we call this basically being epistemically cautious. right? So th this is something that uh, Serge and I, in a, in a paper we wrote together, we saw that kids who are uh, doing the philosophy for children curriculum are actually better at doing. They tend to be more cautious. They, they, they tend to make less generalized conclusions. Uh, they tend to be more skeptical and so on. Uh, so th this is something that can be trained. I mean, I think there's hope here. I mean, I don't want to say this is completely hopeless. But I think that this is one among uh, sort of many types of strategies, right? So the idea, right, is knowing biases and how to correct them. And it's really great when it works. But the thing is, and we have tons of research on this, is that it doesn't work as well as we might want it to. There are different ways of doing it. I mean, I could give you examples that uh, Tim and I use in class in order to, 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 to kind of prompt students in doing that more and more. But still, 
uh, it's quite limited. Right? The third level, and so that's when we get uh, social and when we get uh, where we get environmental. The third level of the biasing, is the idea is that we train agents, either individually or collectively, to create and defer to situational nudges. So, so those of you who know the Tyler and Sunstein stuff, so they mean the, the, this idea of nudge, a small bump we give to people so that they, they go in the right direction, if you, if you will. Uh, that the bias otherwise distorted judgments in context, right? So the idea here is that on, uh, this type of debiasing is where we put part of the cognitive task in the environment. We make it so that students have to rely less on their own cognitive capacity in order to successfully correct their biases. So, right, the idea is that we can put people in an environment that makes them more likely to reason well. So I'll give you a couple of examples of this uh, shortly. And then the fourth level is probably the most controversial, uh, where we train agents individually or collectively to create and defer to processes or other situational constraints that the bias actions or outcomes even when individual ju judgments are uh, distorted and uncorrected. So on the fourth level, the goal is not to correct the bias, but to make it so that there's something in the environment that makes it so that we don't have a choice but to avoid or to go around the bias. Right? Um, so, the, right, we completely remove the source of bias, for example. Or we force the correction of the bias. Or we diminish the strength or the direction of the bias. These are different things we can do. Okay. Uh, so, the general idea here is that with this taxonomy of the biasing, we have more tools now to make it the case that some of the hardest steps in successful debiasing uh, removes, uh, the, uh, removes some of the burden on the individual reasoner. As I said, to reason using the proper logical tools at the right time, in the proper way, and so on and so forth. That's really, really, really hard. So if we can outsource some of that task to the environment or to features uh, that are around people, then the, it should make reasoning easier. And this is something that's widely used in design. So a lot of you might be familiar with this, right? Tie your seatbelt. So what happens if you enter a car, put the key in the contact, and turn it? and don't have your seatbelt on, then you have uh, like some sort of ding, ding, ding that goes on, right? Some sort of, I mean, chime or anything that reminds you that something's not right, that your seatbelt's not on in this case, right? It doesn't force you to do it, right? It just reminds you that you should be doing it. And of course, I mean, there are ways around it, right? You can tie the seatbelt behind your back, which I, I don't think would be a really good idea. Uh, but still, I mean, you, you, you can go around, the, the, I mean, you can go around that signal. But still, here's a reminder in the environment that uh, tells you, I mean, do this. It's good for you, or something along these lines, right? Um, importantly, if you don't do it, right, if you don't tie your seatbelt, the car still starts. So in that sense, this is a level three deviasing strategy, right? Reminds you, puts in the environment the trigger to say, here's something you should think about, and then you can do it, right? So one of the steps that is usually conducted in one's head is now uh, outsourced to the environment, right? Uh, and there are a couple of examples like this in the nudge literature that are more or less strong. Uh, an example of a level four strategy here, by the way, would be one where the car, say, wouldn't start if your seatbelt's not on, right? Um, so how effective is, is this? So in recent work with Frédéric Banville, as I mentioned, we're, we're starting to look at how things happen in the animal realm, right? How other species do it. So, we think that this is something that we actually often see in the study of non-human animal minds. That, I mean, that this sort of offloading parts of the cognitive task into the environment is quite common in the animal realm. We call this idea epistemic levers. Uh, here we work from Jillian Barker's uh, notion of biological lever. So the idea of a biological lever, right, is something that species does uh, in modifying their environment in order to favor their uh, reproductive success in the end, right? So uh, say uh, beavers build their dams, but the dams make it uh, is a protection for the beavers, is a place where they can reproduce and so on. In that sense, the dam is part of what the beaver needs in order to, uh, I mean, to, to, to be successful, right? Uh, epistemic levers is a version of that, but focusing on a floating parts of the cognition into the environment, uh, making it so that some information is stored in the environment to be accessed later, right? So here we, we, we have examples of organisms that develop mechanisms that let them afford cognition into the environment. So some examples, right? 
Uh, so, so friendly study, right, so it suggests that this is quite uh, common. This is something we say, say, see in uh, scrub jays that when they cache things and so on, they rely on uh, various landmarks, they rely on positions of things relatively to each other in order to help them remember where the cache is. Uh, this is also something we see in chipmunks, uh, right? I mean, when they use caches, I mean, they are able to recognize markers in the environment to help them find the caches later on. Um, and, I mean, there are tons and tons and tons, again, of examples of that in the animal realm. I mean, one uh, other example that we quite like is that of uh, sheep and how they find their ways. So the idea is that when a sheep goes through a field where the grass is very tall, uh, it leaves the grass a little bit like on the side and a little bit, I mean, it's not as uh, it was before the sheep went through. But as sheep follow that road, then the road becomes clearer and clearer and more sheep can go through, right? I mean, they can forge their way through. But this is a way of them, of, I mean, putting in the environment the information that uh, this is actually a good path or something along these lines, right? Uh, and if you want to go even lower in terms of cognitive power and so on, you can see that ants can do something very similar in leaving pheromone trails uh, that, are, that are getting stronger and stronger when there's a food source uh, in, on, on that path, right? So a floating part of the cognition environment, that's something that happens very often uh, in the animal realm, right? So we think that here that this is not only theoretically relevant, uh, but it provides, we think, potential strategies uh, in, so that we can adapt uh, to our needs. And again, that's something I think we use a lot. So, I mean, I think here everyone has, or maybe almost everyone has uh, put their clock home five minutes fast to uh, improve their being on time, right? Anyone has ever done that, right? No? <laughs> I mean, this is a strategy that some people use. All right, or you hide some money somewhere in your wallet in a place that's not really accessible. You know it's there in case you mean of emergency, you need like cash or something like that, uh, but it's kind of hidden in your wallet. My, my dad does this for sure. Uh, so, I mean, we have strategies like this that we sometimes use in order to help us think, to help us uh, reason better in given environments, right? So what's the upshot of this? Um, we think that here what counts as reasoning can be understood in a broader context, right? Uh, so again, I mean, reasoning usually is focused on either avoiding the biases altogether or successfully correcting the bias at an individual level. That's kind of the mainstream view that we see in this literature. What we want to say is that we should broaden that to include other types of strategies, those that have to do with nudges and changing the environment, right? We think that the taxonomy here, sorry, uh, broadens the range of teachable strategies largely by introducing socially implemented, socially maintained reasoning in infrastructure of one sort or another. So examples again. If you're going through a hiring process in a company of some sort, you know that, I mean, there's a lot of literature that uh, people with foreign sounding names uh, get less calls for interviews. That's something that we know very well from the literature. So what can you do? Well, you can train people on this. You can say to people, well, I mean, this is not a really good thing. Maybe we should uh, improve our diversity. Maybe we should think about ways of making our hiring process better. Okay, so how can we do it? Well, we can rely on and, and, and be confident that people will do it on their own. Uh, usually, I mean, these strategies work more or less, right? So that would be level two the biasing. A strategy that would be pitched at level three the biasing would be something along the lines of, well, let's have a formal training and put all this information in the red binder that we'll leave at the center of the table. And then by, by looking at the binder, you remind yourself that this is something you might want to do. That I mean, you, there are strategies that are interesting to employ in order to uh, diminish those uh, biases. And the level four strategy would be something along the lines of, say, removing names from CVs altogether, right? So your resume is anonymized. You remove the, that source of bias, right? Different strategies we can use, but what we want to say is that all of these count as sound reasoning. All of these count as sound critical thinking. These are strategies that we can employ in order to think better. Okay? Some of the problems, though, is that when students arrive in courses, well, they sign up as individuals. They are graded as individuals, right? They want a grade for them. They don't want a grade for the whole class. Well, maybe some of them, if you tell them, you, you, you all get A's, yay. Uh, maybe a lot of them will, will, will be happy, but I mean, in general, uh, we uh, want to uh, I mean, assess students individually in universities. And then students 
go off and they leave university, they finish their degree, and they go off in society as individuals. So how can we make sure that we teach these strategies better and better? Um, right? So the question here, one question I, I want to ask, uh, to ask you and so on, and we have some, some ideas for answers here, but I mean that's a more general uh, question. So how can we teach people to create and value social infrastructures that might help them in their decision making processes, right? How can we do that? Um, so what would be classroom strategies, lessons to impart, uh, the, the attitudes and skills to individual students and so on, uh, and then uh, the goal, right, would be in the end uh, that it manifests as social, institutional, legal, or physical infrastructures uh, that mitigate biases and fac facilitate truth con conducive uh, reasoning, right? So that's, that, that, that would be the ideal goal, uh, right? So, but then there are also, and that's a theoretical aspect, we think that there are also consequences for research on reasoning. So, how can we broaden what we study with this research? So I'll give an example from Tuesday. So uh, in Valerie Thompson's talk, uh, she gave this uh, task of solving anagrams, right? So uh, I mean, there was this task where she flashed the anagrams for uh, 500 milliseconds. It was very quick. People had to like, give an assessment of how easy it would be to solve. And then in the second part of the task, it was uh, put on the screen for a lot longer, 30 seconds, where people could take time and solve it. But it wasn't said in her talk whether people were given uh, access to a pen and paper to write the letters down, try different orders, and so on, which I mean, would probably make it, I mean, I don't know how you do anagrams, but I think it does make it quite easier. Another thing we could do, and something that we know people actually do when City Play Scrabble, is that they use the, the, I mean, the, the small tray, and they place and move the letters on the tray, and it helps them see the word and say solve the anagrams in uh, Th that kind of task. So how would that change? Uh, how we think about this? Again, I said this is the beginning of a research program. I don't have any hard data on this. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, promising directions for future research, research. And some of it I plan on uh, undertaking in the next few years, right? But so we can think about some of the cognitive tasks we have people do in the lab. And by thinking about the biasing in this sort of more general social environmental context. I think there are different types of strategies that then we can study more closely to see how effective they might be and then how we could get to teach them uh, properly. <coughs> so there are, say, for example, strategies for the workplace that we might uh, have people to implement as well. So these were the strategies for researchers. Uh, so maybe there are strategies for the workplace we might be interested as well. Gave the CV example already, right? Uh, so the biases in hiring, we can anonymize CVs. We can also say when we want to hire for an orchestra, do something like anonymizing uh, the auditions, right? So we have something like a screen, and then we have something like a carpet on the, uh, on the floor because uh, the types of shoes that men and women wear are not always the same. Uh, especially in formal dresses, right? So we put a carpet on the floor, we put a screen, and you, ha you have the musicians play. Uh, Golden and Rouse, in a really, really interesting paper, uh, compare different orchestras around the world and show that orchestras that use this technique of putting a screen and putting a carpet on the floor actually have much higher rate of women musician that reflects more closely who actually graduates from, say, musical school, right? While the places in which they don't have such a screen usually tend to favor men over women uh, in who they hire as musicians. Right? So again, this is something that we do already. The thing is that this is usually seen as a feature or something like that I mean, that people do, but not necessarily as a reasoning strategy or as a critical thinking strategy. And the goal of the scope of the biasing that I put forward with Tim Kenyon is precisely to say that this is good reasoning. Doing that, putting that screen up, putting the carbon on the floor, is actually improving how we reason, and that's genuinely reasoning and thinking in just the same way as it is when we learn logical rules, right? So some directions for future research, right? So we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A, which is perfect, because I mean, some of the ideas usually uh, serve some controversy, and I'm here forward to hearing those, right? So first of all, uh, we want to have questions about the ecological validity of the procedures. We want to make sure that whatever procedure that we end up with, that we start using and that we teach, uh, are actually working in a variety of environments. 
right? We don't want to use a strategy that seems good on paper, but then uh, in actuality just doesn't work. We also want these strategies to be transferable. So when we, uh, I mean, in part of strategy, when we think about how uh, people can do the, the, the different thinking strategies, we want those people to be able to transfer those strategies. So say in the golden and rouse example, how can you take this example from orchestras and apply them in other areas of life or of hiring and so on, right? There are ways to do it, but I don't think it's straightforward. And we have to think closely about how we can actually do that. Um, there's also this, I mean, and this is closely connected with this general problem of implementation, right? Uh, we want to implement that in classrooms. We might want to impl implement that in the workplace and so on. Uh, but uh, I mean, we have to figure out how we can do that. Right? And we also, and this is the project I mentioned quickly with uh, Banville, uh, where we want to also think about the cognitive and evolutionary foundations of the mechanisms at work. Right? And so some of the, one, one, one of the examples that uh, we might want to use and so that's uh, in the Bolak and Canyon paper uh, that will appear soon in Tepoy. Uh, there are individual strategies that we might want to have people learn uh, just as well as uh, social stra strategies. So an example of individual strategy that works quite well, so something that we should definitely think, uh, teach in critical thinking courses, is a strategy that we call uh, consider the opposite. <clears throat> something that uh, really means sound, uh, I mean, sound doing in, uh, in science in general, but to force people and to bring people to, uh, whenever they uh, face a problem, to think about the opposite uh, opinion that, uh, the, than the one that they might hold uh, intuitively. So to force people to consider the negation of what they believe to be true, and to consider it very, very seriously. So consider the opposite is actually a really, really good level two strategy. Um, so it works well, but again, I mean, sometimes it just doesn't work. Another strategy that we uh, are trying to implement, and that's something that relates to uh, the Merci and Sperber work that was mentioned uh, before, that I mean, we reason better in social context and so on, is to pair students up. So I mean, that's something I usually do in, in like my, my first class. Of, I mean, every course I teach, first class, I do this activity with my students. So I, ha I, I pair them up, and then I give them a topic they have to defend an opinion on. Uh, usually it's something silly like uh, who is the better musician, uh, Justin Bieber or Justin Timberlake, uh, or I mean, uh, I mean how much, uh, I mean how much, uh, I mean I don't know, like uh, Celine Dion versus Barbara Streisand or whatever. I mean like popular artists that they might know, I mean, might not really care about that much. Uh, but and then and then I, I go around the class and I assign to the students who they will defend, right? So you will defend that Justin Bieber is the, the best musician. You will defend that Justin Timberlake is the best musician. And they appear students up in that way. And then I ask them in like five minutes to come up with arguments that they might want uh, to, uh, to defend, I mean, to, to, to defend the, the, their position. And they have to give these arguments to the other person. And then the other person's role is to give a, a, a rebuttal, just like, a, I mean, I don't think this is right because X, Y, or NZ. And then the first person, I mean, I mean it's a, the first person's turn again. And the role in that task is then to say, well, okay, so you convinced me I was wrong and you are right. So that's the only thing they have to say. And then I have switched them around. And I asked then students to give a short written report of that activity. And students, even though they really didn't care about the positions they were defending, actually say that it felt uncomfortable to say after someone gave them counter arguments that they were just right, that they couldn't come up with counter arguments or something like that to respond to the person, right? Uh, so here again, I mean, triggering various things uh, so that students realize, I mean, it's hard to admit you're wrong, right? And, and things like that. So I mean, these, are, these are examples of activities that uh, we have in mind uh, in this work. Right? Uh, so my take home message again, more strategies out, uh, ought to count, count as being reasoning or critical thinking strategies. They should have influences on both the research we are doing on reasoning as well as in the way we teach students reasoning skills. And because I think that, uh, I mean, thinking about problems and thinking about reasoning is a social process, I will now take your comments and questions so that we can uh, work through this together. Thank you.